Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Tom Ruth Speaker Series. I'm your host, Zach Lehman, Headmaster here at the Hill. Welcome to all of you joining us. We have quite a few people here tonight. Uh, as most of you know, the Tom Ruth Speaker Series was created in honor of longtime beloved instructor of history emeritus, Tom Ruth, also known as The Truth, who taught at the Hill for 33 years and passed away in February 2016. I think Tom would be especially excited about our guest tonight. Norman Perlstein, class of 1960. Uh, Norman Perlstein, I call him Norm. Is that okay, Norm? Uh -huh. Can I call you Norm? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, Norman Perlstein is the executive editor of the LA Times. Before joining the Los Angeles Times in 2018, Perlstein served as the chief content officer and then vice chairman of Time Incorporated. Prior to that, he was the chief content officer at Bloomberg LP. For nearly five decades, Norm Perlstein has worked as a reporter and editor. He was editor-in-chief of Time Incorporated from 1995 to 2005 before becoming a senior advisor to Time Warner. At Time, Perlstein oversaw the editorial content of Time Incorporated's 154 magazines. Previously, Perlstein worked for the Wall Street Journal, Forbes Magazine, the Asian Wall Street Journal, and the Wall Street Journal Europe. He also launched Smart Money Magazine for Dow Jones and Company and the Hearst uh, Corporation. Now, this is a picture of Norm uh, from his uh, from the dial. Uh, I won't hold it up there too long, but you know, it's a pretty similar smile I see there tonight, Norm. Uh, originally from Collegeville, Pennsylvania, or at least from Collegeville when he came to Hill. A lot of activities there. Uh, here's the uh, here's his editorial picture from the Hill News. Which one are you there, Norm? Can you well, spot I see, uh, Doug Greer, our editor? I think um, and. Uh, Michael Penny, and then I'm uh, got the glasses on, uh, sort of. I guess it's two to the left. Got it. All right. Well, uh, that looks like a picture straight out of the uh, library right. uh, up in the uh, McNally room, what we call the McNally room now. Um, so, Norm, thanks for joining us tonight. Here we are. So how did you find your way to Hill? You were, you were from Collegeville. Were you a day student? I was a day student for the first uh, three years and then uh, was, uh, spent my junior and senior year uh, in the dorms. Uh, so there were, you went to Hill for five years. That means you started as a second former. Correct. Yeah. So a lot of our listeners tonight don't, don't know Hill when it had a second form. Right. Well, it was a small group of us. Um, the second form, there were only about 15 of us who were in it, and then a whole bunch of kids came in for third form. So did most of those second formers make it all the way through the five years? Um, yes. Uh, there were very few dropouts at that time. Uh, the school was a little smaller, about 450. And, um, and for the most part, people who came stuck it out. And was there a sort of a special bond between those uh, those kids? Um, you know, I'm I'm not sure about that. I thought there were um, you know sort of subsets of um, you know there were some kids who were very social. There were others who were total introverts, like myself, and um, and then there were some who were really defined through athletics. Um, 
that was really a very important part of, of education. And, uh, and I think for many kids there will remember, if nothing else, getting a chance to play sports that they might not have otherwise. What, what sports did you play when you were at Hill? Um, well, I ran cross country and, um, and then I, I wrestled uh, my last couple of years there. Was that under the legendary Frank Bissell, or was that a little before? Correct. Yeah, it was under, and he was an extraordinary coach. And it was kind of odd, but I uh, chose to go to Haverford because I, I thought that it was the one place where the teams were not as good as the teams at Hill and that I'd probably get to play more. So um, that worked out fairly well for me. Well, I know that one of our listeners tonight, uh, Mr. Dahlhoff, one of our math uh, senior masters here at the Hill School, uh, who's also a Haverford graduate, wanted me to ask about your formative years at Haverford, but we'll skip that for now. Um, so, one, so one question about your time at Hill. Um, when did you sort of get the spark uh, for writing or journalism, and how did that come about? Well, I um, was, it's a good question where it actually started, but um, I took my last two years, I took a course called Humanities that was taught by Paul Chancellor. And it really, um, I think, opened my eyes to the world beyond our studies. And uh, there was just a level of intellectual curiosity that he, um, you know, imbued in all of us. So uh, I'd say that um, there were a few of us who gravitated either towards the news and uh, then others who worked on the yearbook. And we had a few people who started a uh, somewhat, it was, I guess you could call it a, today a counterculture magazine called uh, Visions and Revisions. And that was a combination of reporting and fiction that you might call long form today. Was that a, an underground uh, paper here at the yes. Hill, or did it have? It was, well, it, it got sanctioned after a while, but it it started underground, and it was uh, it had no real faculty direction. It was uh, Bill Daly was the editor of it, and Robbie Weddle provided the graphics. Um, and um, for a few of us, it was uh, it was really the most fun of all the projects we worked on. So you'll be pleased to know that we still have a very strong humanities program here at Hill. Uh, we actually have three of our faculty members who teach it now uh, in the grand tradition of Paul Chancellor. Um, I'm gonna ask our students on the line to raise their hand if they happen to be in uh, humanities. I'm not gonna call on you, but just would love to know. Yep, I see a few hands going up, which is great. Um, so uh, they, they're in the same room that you took that course in, the Levis room, now called the Levis Alexandre room, up on the third floor of the library. And uh, um, it's a great tradition here at the, at the Hill. So yeah, uh, it was uh, the only place where I got, had a conflict with Chancellor was that I was a, was a kid. I don't know how I became a jazz nut. And we had a jazz club and uh, Chancellor hated jazz. He was only like classical music and refused to um, do anything with jazz musicians. He, he equated jazz to sitting in a purple room and um, and ultimately getting bored with the color purple. So that was the one place where we had a conflict. Well, I'm sure I'm sure it was forgiven. I bet you were a pretty good student in that class. Yes. So let's fast okay. forward a bit. Uh, you go to Haverford. Um, what was your first job in journalism? Well, I, um, aside from the college newspaper, which I did edit, um, I spent every summer in college, I spent uh, two summers in Allentown with the Call Chronicle newspapers, and then uh, a summer as a police reporter with the Philadelphia Inquirer. So when I came out of college, um, my father was a lawyer in Norristown in a 20-man firm that included six of my relatives. And so there was a lot of pressure to go to law school, which I didn't really feel like doing. But um, I went and didn't get back into journalism, really, until uh, I graduated from law school. Uh, 
So, uh, but those um, those summer jobs really convinced me that uh, journalism would be fun, would be would reward a curious mind. Uh, I got very lucky. I had uh, decided during my freshman year at Haverford that I wanted to get a summer internship. And I wrote letters to 30 newspapers in Pennsylvania asking for an internship. And 29 either turned me down or didn't answer it. But uh, the morning call sent me a note, offered me a job, $55 a week, uh, starting in June. And um, I was excited. I went to Allentown, spent the summer working there, knowing that the editor was a guy named Bill Reimert, and that he was an active uh, alum of Ursinus College. Uh, in fact, he was chairman of their board, and he, of course, had no time for summer interns in, their, in between their freshman and sophomore year, but I um, got through it. At the end of the summer, he came up to me and he said, how do you think the Grizzlies are going to do in football? And I knew that the Grizzlies were the Ursinus Bears. And so I said to him, uh, I said, well, I don't know, but I'm sure they'll beat us. And he looked at me and said, well, what do you mean us? And I said, well, I go to Haverford. And he said, you what? I said, yeah, I go to Haverford. He said, well, I remember your application. You're from Collegeville. And I said, yeah, I live in Collegeville, but I go to Haverford. And he said, well, shit, that's the only reason I hired you was I thought you went to Ursinus. And, um, so that's how I got into journalism. And uh, I think it was the first time I realized that it's better to be lucky than to be smart. Well, so one of our questions has already come in from one of our students and it, it was basically the next question I was gonna ask, which is obviously you, you sort of worked your way up. What do you think was your sort of big break? Um, when, did your, when did your journalism career take off? When, you know, when was that okay. moment? So I came out of law school and I went to work at the New York Times as what they then called a copy boy. There were no women doing this. And I was a terrible copy boy. I hated it. Um, was it actually close to getting fired when um, a Hill graduate several years ahead of me named Neil Ullman contacted me. We had met when I was in law school. He was in the Philadelphia Bureau of the Wall Street Journal. And I um, told him that I was taking this job at the New York Times as a copy boy and that if I got lucky, I'd get promoted. And he said, that's a terrible job. Why would you want to do that? And I said, oh, you don't understand. It's the New York Times. And about three or four months later, I was actually thinking that I would either get fired at the Times or quit and go practice law with my father when Neil Ullman called me and said, how's that great job of yours? And I said, well, it's really terrible. Um, and I'm about to quit. And he said, well, we've got a couple of vacancies at the Wall Street Journal. And um, so I applied and I got hired in Dallas. Um, and it was really thanks to Ullman. He was, um, he was a fantastic journalist uh, who was, um, I got to know much better in later years. But um, I went to uh, Dallas and I was the youngest, most uh, inexperienced reporter in the bureau. So they gave me um, the cotton beat, and I couldn't think of anything more boring than covering cotton. And it's a commodity, and who cared? But the way the journal worked was um, coverage of cities was a reflection of what your beat was. And since the cotton exchange was in Memphis, I um, got sent to Memphis about three months after I had joined uh, the journal, um, I took a morning at the Cotton Exchange and just said, God, there's nothing here I could possibly want to cover. But it turned out there was a garbage strike going on in Memphis at exactly that time. And um, I realized that Martin Luther King was coming to Memphis to support the garbage worker. So I hung around and ended up getting what I, believe was the last interview with King before he was assassinated April 4th of 1968. And so the journal being a, a really egalitarian place of meritocracy, let me stay with that story over the next several weeks, James Earl Ray's arrest, um, the settlement of the garbage strike, all those things 
uh, got me much more attention than I would have otherwise possibly had. So I'd say that was the, the break that really made a huge difference in my career. That's an amazing uh, story. Um, you know, one of the things I picked up on there pretty early is the importance of that Hill connection you mentioned. Um, you know, the old phrase, Hill ties never sever. Uh, it's, right. it's very true today. I mean, I talked to a lot of our alums who got a break uh, or got a job offer or had some great advice early on. So I hope that our students and alumni who are listening take that to heart. I know that's Absolutely. Really when I started in, in Dallas, um, you know, I was covering the Southwest and I had a, knew a couple guys who were a year ahead of me at Hill who were in uh, Houston, Thad Hutchison, and uh, yeah. and um, and uh, so through Thad, I got plugged in. His father had been quite active in Republican politics, and uh, that was one of those connections that again served me quite well. And it was really through him that I first met Jim Baker, who uh, of course. Is who we're hoping to be on this show before the end of the spring. We're working on uh, Secretary Baker joining the show at some point. Uh, well, well, I'm sure you've I'm sure you've returned the favor many times over to Hill alums and others. Um, so, but it's just a, a good point there. Now, you spent most of your career back in New York City on the East Coast, right? You you were there well, the time and with thirty five years there, but. Um, but you know, before that, it was uh, Dallas, Detroit, Los Angeles, Tokyo, Hong Kong, um, back to LA, and then uh, New York for about a year and a half, and then I was in Brussels. But from 1983 until um, until really coming out here, I'd been I was in New York for 35 years, but, but came to the West Coast quite often, and of course, had worked in LA twice before this gig came along. So. I want to get to the LA Times pretty quickly, but um, I, I'm sure our listeners want to know um, one or two pretty amazing stories from your time at Time. Um, what were what were some of the things that you felt were big milestones for you or for for Time that you were in, intimately involved with? Yeah, well, 9/11 of course was um, the biggest story I of my life until frankly now when I'm I think in many ways this um, coronavirus may be the biggest story uh, of of my life and of any journalist. But 9-11 was um, one of those remarkable days where, uh, for instance, the Wall Street Journal's newsroom was blown out. So they had a very hard time producing a publication the next day. Um, at time, uh, we did a special issue, both of time and of people, so that we were on the street with um, magazines within 24 hours for time, 36 hours for people. And at that time, of course, nobody knew exactly whether this was, you know, beginning of World War III, what, uh, what all this meant. All we knew was just this extraordinary destruction of downtown New York. And so I'd say that was, Certainly, the um, the biggest story, uh, one of the more complicated ones, was covering the Clinton impeachment uh, because um, this was before um, our current president was in the White House, uh, breaking rules at a level that none of us had seen before. But um, the Clinton impeachment was was also just a very big story, and frankly, the role of Hillary and Chelsea in remaining with the president um, became an important part of that story as well. So you've been out in LA how many years now? Two. Two. Uh, obviously, you've been there before. What What was the impetus for you to make that shift um, from magazines, especially back to? Uh, yeah. Well, I had retired. In LA Times is one of the top four newspapers in the country, as I understand, yeah. right? Right. It was, although in the years um, that it was owned by the Tribune Company from Chicago, there was really a an effort to scale back on everything. And so by the time the current owner bought it uh, in 2018, it, it was 
it was still the largest newsroom west of the Potomac, but it um, was about a third the size of the New York Times, where, say, as late as 2005, it had been about the same. Uh, I was doing some consulting in Asia uh, with a newspaper in New Delhi, uh, with a conference group in Singapore, and so forth. And I had, um, but along the way, I had met the owner, uh, Patrick Soonshong, who is a physician who made a lot of money developing and selling cancer drugs. And we'd kept up over the years. And when I found that uh, he had acquired it, I reconnected with him and he said to me, help, help me find an editor. And um, I like to say the inner Dick Cheney in me rose up. And, uh, you know, just as when uh, George Bush was asking him to find a vice president and he looked in the mirror and decided he was it. So when uh, Patrick and his wife, Michelle, um, asked me if I would become <clears throat> the editor, um, it was exciting. Because <clears throat> it, um, you know, Los Angeles is a great city. It is really the center of creativity in the country. Um, it is very much a sports town. We have 11 major league teams. And if you think of Las Vegas as a suburb, we go to 13. Uh, we've got the Olympics coming in uh, 2028, a piece of the World Cup in 2026, um, a Super Bowl, um, a couple NCAA championship games. And, um, you know, it's obviously the entertainment capital of the world, but it's also a center for food and for art and um, obviously important in other areas as well. So um, whether it's environment or immigration or homes and homelessness, defining issues of the day, you know, California and the White House are about as opposite as any uh, two entities could be. And so when I look at uh, 2020, when I look at California, when I think about uh, the California lens looking at the rest of the country or the world, it's an incredible story. I'm one of those people who believes the 21st century will be a Pacific century and that Los Angeles will be America's anchor um, in that Pacific Rim. Uh, it's a fascinating city today. Um, Los Angeles is 47% Hispanic. Um, almost 20% Asian American. And even though um, most of the people were born in the US with English as a first language, they self-identify very much uh, as either Hispanic or Korean American or something. And so that both creates a kind of raw energy, but also tremendous challenges for a publication in terms of how to reach those communities. So I want to get to how you're addressing COVID-19, but just one question again for our students. What does it mean, like, what do you do every day in your job? You know, what, what does it mean to be the executive editor or editor-in-chief of a, a, of a major publication like this? Are you making editorial decisions? Are you making business decisions or all of that? Give, us, give our students a sense of what it means well, to be. With you it's a do. tough balancing act, and I can only speak to my own experience, but um, I think, with, I don't know how it happened, but with my first management job, I came to understand that the more you delegate, the more you get to do. And I think that's counterintuitive for a lot of people who say, gee, if I, if I delegate too much, they won't need me. Um, I've always taken the position that if I could surround myself with people who I thought were better than I am or who had specialties that complemented my interests rather than replicating them, um, I would be quite successful. And I think if, if asked what, um, what I can look back on with pride, it's not so much a story I wrote or um, a coverage area as it is, um, a great pride in the people whom I worked with and uh, where they've gone on to be highly successful. And so 
I tend to focus a lot of my energy on uh, trying to work with the most talented people I can find, trying to delegate as much as I can um, to them. <clears throat> and so I do end up having to do a fair amount of administration. Um, in this case, I spend a lot of time with our owner who is, is a fascinating uh, and complicated uh, character. And, um, and yet, you, if you get too divorced from the story, then you will never be effective. So um, I do most of my news reading, frankly, at night. Um, the big challenge for us was to take a print-centric newsroom and really make it much more digital and, and really convert us into a 24-7 newsroom. I do read every major story prior to publication and certainly spend time with the big investigated signature pieces that uh, really are what make you a great newsroom and make you a magnet for talent. But I would say that the most important thing I've done in the two years that I've been at the Los Angeles Times is create a succession team of people mostly in their early 40s, late 30s, who will be ready to continue the revival of the publication. Well, speaking of your team, uh, tell us a little bit about um, how operations are happening now. I mean, obviously our sure. students and most of us are working from home. I imagine you are too, but uh, yes. How are you keeping well, that all together? Well, first of all, um, there's no way anybody could really prepare for a pandemic. Uh, we read about them, we hear about them, we think about, is it bioterrorism or whatever, but until it happens, it's not the kind of thing you can easily do a dress rehearsal on. We had often asked ourselves the question if for some reason um, our building, which is adjacent to uh, LAX, the airport, if it got taken out, how could we work? We print in East LA, so it's always been remote printing, but it was only when our owner, who happens to be one of the leading uh, virologists and um, researchers on vaccines in the world, told us that this was so highly contagious that he just thought we had to get out of the building that we we left early. And so we had from the beginning to try to figure out how we could produce a publication which for the most part thrived on people walking around and talking to each other all day. And I would say that Zoom is the most important change or, or any kind of video conferencing like this. Um, it has enabled us to publish. Uh, the weak link is that we still have uh, an important part of our business is print. And the printing press is run by a group of, of mostly men in their 60s whose health is not all that good. And so we've been very worried about them. We take temperatures every day at the printing press. We've cut back on our print publications so that we can make it a faster run and, and make sure that um, this group of people are healthy because without that, we could go down really quite quickly with an important product. Um, during this time, however, it's really been um, a remarkable pulling together of the entire news organization. For example, with sports in hiatus, um, a number of the sports reporters are now doing general assignment, uh, city covering the city. A number of editors have switched over to the copy desk from the sports desk. Um, and we've seen sort of examples like that. Uh, investigative reporters who've been working on a whole bunch of accountability stories are now doing kind of rapid response stuff. So if our president says that everybody who needs a mask can get one, um, we'll have an investigative group that will challenge that assertion. And so um, I'd say right now, 
there's not a part of the news staff, and we've got over 500 journalists working at the Los Angeles Times, and not one of them is working on something unrelated to uh, to the coronavirus. Um, we will hit a point, as will our audiences, where we're going to have to step back from that. Uh, but for now, um, it has overshadowed the election. It has overshadowed uh, the conventions. As you know, the Olympics um, were pushed back a year. So when you think of all the major events um, that have been canceled and you think about the remarkable speed with which we have gone from a relatively healthy economy with uh, low unemployment to a point where uh, we are looking at numbers we haven't seen since the Depression, um, it's both a remarkable challenge to cover and also just a fascinating story. Yeah, a few things you just said um, sparked my interest. You know, the first of all is the print piece. Um, you know, as I talk to even my parents or friends and neighbors, a lot of people have, you know, stopped their print subscriptions for the time being. Um, so maybe that's a, maybe that's a solution. Um, I'm not sure that's yeah. where you need to go, but, you know, people are a little hesitant to add to the mail or to delivery. Right. That's well, sort of and you should wear gloves when you remove the plastic from the paper, that's for sure. Um, and then, um, uh, well, a lot of people are, but we have had an extraordinary surge of uh, subscriptions. We, in an effort to be more inclusive, we put a number of stories uh, we give away for free. We do a daily free newsletter on the virus. Uh, we will start next week a daily podcast, and we offer an eight-week trial subscription for a dollar. And you say, why a dollar? Well, because we want to, first of all, get the email addresses so we can continue to interact with the people who come in. But more importantly, we just feel we have to establish the principle that our, we are providing content that's worth paying for. Well, before we started the show, you made a kind offer to provide some uh, free subscriptions to some of our students. So I'll follow up with, with you on that with our journalism. Just teacher. give us a sign up and we'll take care of it. Um, the other, the other thing you mentioned um, that I uh, found interesting is this notion of people sort of shifting gears, and and you know we ha we're having that here at Hill. We have athletic coaches who are now helping out with academic programs or dean of students, and um, so it, it's a real interesting professional challenge as people uh, flex those those you know old muscles. I'm wondering when they ask you to be a copy boy again. You know, is yeah, that, that, well, I think that's right. Um, if the printers uh, go out for any reason, that could happen very quickly. Um, I do think that it's going to be a great challenge for our country to see how quickly we bounce back, whether we are learning things from this period, either about ourselves or about society that may change. Uh, some priorities. Um, you know, we are. We have a week here in California where we're being told um, not to um, even go to the supermarket. Don't buy groceries. Uh, don't leave the the your dwelling for a week. And you know, will that lead to more binge watching of television? Will people look at each other and say, "Do we really need um, that?" You know, two cars and so forth. So. I think it's it's there is the potential that this could be a slower economic recovery than people would like, um, and you know at some point we will have to figure out what to do with uh, the additions to the deficit that are so necessary and so important under these circumstances. As exa you you also mentioned this notion that every story is about uh, COVID nineteen right now. Uh, you know, on my news feed, on my iPhone, I would say that's exactly, the, it, it's actually almost comical when I see some other story come up that has nothing to do with COVID-19. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes will just read it for fun because I, I want to change the, change the page, so to speak. As, as the executive editor, when will you know that it's time to start talking about other things again? Right. Well, we have a lot of metrics. Um, you know, in a digital world, you know, um, how many people go to a story, how long they stay with it. 
um, what they're curious about. And I would say that really um, up until a couple days ago, almost all of the interest was in um, how bad, um, uh, how many people have uh, um, been infected, um, how many people have died, how quickly is that happening. Um, you know, we were looking at New York and saying, will California be like it, or is it the fact that we're all in cars instead of subways that there's less contact and so forth? So, um, but we take a look and you'll see things such as, uh, I don't know, well, we interviewed a, a Nobel Prize winning chemist who asserted that he thought the turnaround would be faster and that uh, the need for quarantine would be shorter than what others were saying. And that ended up being the most read story for like four days in a row. And I think that said to us that people are looking for solutions. They're looking for answers. They're looking for some reason to uh, be hopeful. And so you don't want to go the route of um, our president and say everybody ought to take this anti-malaria drug, even though it hasn't been proven because a few of his friends say it's the smart thing to do. Um, I think as a publication, we have to, we, we can't be that irresponsible, um, but that uh, nonetheless, you do need to listen to your audience in terms of knowing what's important to it. And how are your, I mean, I assume a lot of your reporters are working from home um, and researchers are working from right, home. But, right. um, I, I've got to imagine some of them are out there in the city. And, yes, we've had photographs get, and interviewing people in person. You can't do everything by Zoom. No, how are you, how are you managing that? Person and certainly, you know, we have a huge homelessness problem in uh, Los Angeles County. There's 60,000 documented homeless people, and they are uh, at risk themselves and services that were readily available to them were being diverted to these pressing emergencies. So, you know, we have reporters who are, whose beat is homelessness and um, we've, we've outfitted them with masks. We insist that they wear protective clothing, but uh, we also recognize that um, they are at risk. We urge them to, um, get tested whenever it is necessary. And um, we watch them awfully carefully. Um, we'll say things like, um, you know, you may want to just drive by with your photographer, take a picture, and then call back for your interview rather than going and knocking on a door as you might under other circumstances. Because we see this as a, a highly contagious um, uh, virus that really requires extraordinary protection um, if we are going to both curb it and keep people healthy. So one of the stories I read today, um, I can't remember if it was in the LA Times or not, but involved California and, and your governor, uh, basically Governor Newsom saying that um, he doesn't expect the surge there until May and the uh, state of California is now shipping, I think it was like four or 600 ventilators to New York or loaning them to New York. Um, what do you think that LA is, is doing differently or the West Coast is doing differently than the East Coast right now? And, and, and do you think that the surge being pushed out till May is a good thing um, for, uh, do you think that's accurate? Well, it depends on so many variables in terms of how serious it is. Um, if we learned anything from South Korea, from Singapore, um, it is that a total lockdown gives you the best chance of getting out ahead of uh, this um, pandemic. And yet that's the hardest thing I think for Americans to adjust to the idea of what do you mean I can't go surfing, I can't be on the beach. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's contrary to so much of the kind of libertarian uh, rugged individualism that we uh, we tend to, um, you know, at least in a fictionalized way, pay attention to. So I think part of the difference is that um, 
both at the city and state level, we had um, we had elected officials who listened to what the experts in healthcare and in medicine were telling them. So I think we started taking uh, very restrictive measures far earlier than um, other states did. So that I think is one uh, major distinction. Yeah. Uh, I also think that um, what I've seen here, just people wearing masks on the street, uh, seeing um, the ways in which people are really taking these warnings so seriously is I think a little different from uh, the earliest days on the East Coast. Um, you would think with 400,000 Chinese coming into America in the month of January um, and early week of February, that California would be more at risk because so many people came in through California. But I think it was really closing the schools early, uh, urging people just not to leave their dwellings, uh, and people were listening. So in a, in a moment here, I'm, I'm, I'm giving our listeners a warning that we're going to start taking questions. I have one more question for you, but sure. this is a time for our uh, listeners to either post in the Q&A, um, which is at the bottom center of your screen, or to raise your hand, um, and we'll call on a few of our listeners to ask their questions live to Norm here tonight. Um, so my, my last question, and then I'll turn to our, our viewers, is um, uh, how do you think this long term is going to affect your, your newspaper? Yeah. Um, what is well, the newsroom, what's the newsroom going to be like post COVID-19? What, what things are you learning now that might change the way you do business? Well, I think that there's a lot of mixed messages. One that is you have to recognize is that um, the print advertising that is an important part of our business model just fell apart very quickly. Um, you know, if a real estate agent can't have an open house, then it's going to be tough to, it doesn't make much sense to, to advertise it. Um, if the restaurants are closed, there's no um, demand to reach an audience. Um, uh, so I would say we saw a rapid decline in um, print advertising, and it will be interesting to see whether it's a rapid return or a slower one. I'm guessing slower. And I think that one consequence of that is it just pushes us that much harder toward being a 24-7 newsroom um, with uh, a focus on digital. And there, I think you have to ask the question, what are people willing to pay for? And it breaks down, I'd say, into three or four things we need to do more of. One is uh, something called service journalism, which is not um, what reporters grow up dreaming to do much of. But uh, if we can tell our customers um, what schools are open, which ones are closed, where to get um, a dentist, if you have an emergency, uh, that kind of uh, sort of gritty service journalism really gets a reaction. So I think we have to recognize that. Uh, secondly, that um, local coverage in a time of crisis like this is the most important thing you can do. It's complicated in Los Angeles. We have 88 municipalities in Los Angeles County, uh, another 38 in Orange County. So it's very hard to do that kind of micro coverage. But if you open up your pages and encourage your uh, readers and viewers to participate, then you, you can learn a few things very quickly. Uh, so I'd say that is one of the lessons learned. I think another one is, um, in a way, a challenge to, um, to both to all kinds of people involved in government in terms of, um, you know, does the safety net really make a difference? Um, when we look at some of the programs that were shut down over the last three years, including a $200 million a year program to study pandemics, um, you realize that if the, as much as people complain about big government, 
there's no alternative to that that can provide the kind of safety net and the kind of service that um, we really uh, have come to think less of over the years. And if you think about, um, you know, there's no country except probably South Korea that you could look to and Singapore, which is very small, that have really done it right. But um, I think it will be very interesting to see whether these extraordinary powers that we've given uh, our governors, our mayors, our president will remain or whether they, that will revert to something more like what we've been doing. Ready for some questions? Of course. All right. So here's our first question. Um, do you feel satisfied with your job? Is there ever a time when there's too much to a news story that it's too hard to write, such as writing a news story on 9-11? Yeah, yeah. Well, on 9-11, I was very lucky that Time Magazine had an editor named Nancy Gibbs who had written over 170 cover stories. And all I had to do was make sure she was writing and I knew everything would be okay for it. I've, um, I was um, not a good writer. Writing came to me as slowly. I'm still don't consider myself a good writer, but I was one of these people who, who in my early years couldn't write a second paragraph until the first paragraph was perfect. And if I was on deadline, I could write 1500 words in an hour. If I was writing a feature, it could take two weeks to write 1500 words. Um, I realized my career wasn't gonna get very far like that. So one of the things I trained myself to do was just write a draft as fast as I could, an embarrassingly bad draft, but just get something done. And then I was editing and I was okay because I realized that while writing was difficult, I could look at whatever I saw on that had been written and I knew what to do with it. So that trick may not work for everyone, but it's the way I've handled complicated stories. All right, well, we have our first hand up. Uh, this is going to be Greta, one of our fifth formers here. I'm gonna unmute you, Greta. You ready, Greta? Yeah, hi. <laughs> hi, Greta. Good to hear your voice. Where Thank are you, Greta? First of all. Um, I'm in Chester Springs, Pennsylvania. Right. Um, so, um, I was curious about your thoughts on journalism's effect on politics and political change, and if there were any stories that you've published that you feel were particularly impactful. Thank you. Well, it's a great question, and it's one that is changing so quickly. And of course, with um, technology, uh, the whole issue of how stories uh, get as assembled and disseminated becomes uh, really questionable, and with um, each side accusing the other of providing fake news, um, I fear that the reputation of journalism really suffers uh, with all of that. Um, I have felt that um, that some of the biggest stories are ones that you least expect and that you can't plan for, uh, but if you have the um, right skill sets and you're lucky enough to have a story break your way, um, then uh, I think you can find great satisfaction in, in doing it. I had one example where I was living in Tokyo in 1975 and I was then covering Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and in April of 75, our, our Vietnam correspondent had to come back to the US on a family emergency. And I was the only person who could get a visa and get it into Saigon very quickly. And I'd never covered the war. I'd never much thought about it. I'd once read a book about Dien Bien Phu and the French in Vietnam, but um, I, got a visa, I got on a plane, I landed in uh, Saigon um, the day that uh, the president 
resigned and left a week later when the general surrendered. I was on one of the last flights out of Saigon into Guam. And that week, um, I, I don't remember sleeping. I'm sure I did at some point, but just the chance to have a story like that as the, the final collapse of Saigon was one of those things you can't prepare for, but it, but when it comes along, you just know you have no choice but to, to just push as hard as you can. Greta, thanks for a great question. Uh, you, ha you had one written question. Um, uh, Greta wanted to know, other than your own, what is your favorite newspaper? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's a hard one because it's, it's sort of for what? Uh, the New York Times is the, a great news organization which has a remarkably talented staff that produces uh, memorable pieces. I would say that um, the Washington Post uh, under Marty Barron, its editor, and now the ownership of Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, um, is a just a wonderfully reported, well-written um, publication that I, I pay a lot of attention to. Uh, but I read other ones as well. The Toronto Globe and Mail, with a quite small staff, um, has uh, 24 data scientists working in its newsroom, looking at every development and giving you a ranking as to how much reader interest there might be in it. And while no editor wants to turn over responsibility for coverage to a data scientist, having that kind of resource is really interesting to me. So I pay a lot of attention to that publication. All right, so we're all going to be reading the Toronto Globe and Mail tomorrow. I'm going to add that to my <laughs> to my list. Thank you, Greta. Thank Hope you so much. Know what's going on in the subcontinent? Then the Hindustan Times in New Delhi is a great place to start. All right, um, so we have a uh, a question from uh, one of our listeners. It says, "How do you think your Hill experience equipped you to navigate such an exciting career?" Well, um, I'm going to give you an answer that may, may not be the one you'd like, uh, and I've, I've once before talked about it, but um, I want to talk about, in my case, frankly, the power of a negative role model. Um, I ran cross country, uh, was not very good at it, and there was one weekend my senior year where uh, we always ran between at halftime we would run and finish the last hundred yards um i ran one of the best races i'd ever run except that i collapsed at the 40 yard line uh and was carried off the field um the coach was uh, a very tough-minded guy who came in and um basically yelled at me for embarrassing him in front of the crowd at the game and refused to let me run for the rest of the season. Um, and I would say ever since I got into management, I would um, encourage people to take risks, to push themselves as hard as they can. And if it didn't work, to try to encourage them to try again. So I hate to say that when I look back on the Hill School in terms of what its greatest influence was on me, it may have been what was my greatest embarrassment and humiliation at the time. Well, uh, I hope that doesn't happen again here, at least under my watch. Although I will say, I think that old tradition of finishing the cross country races in the football stadium at halftime is a pretty pretty good one. I've actually asked our coaches to uh, arrange that for Lawrenceville weekend this coming year. So hopefully we'll be able to recreate that experience. And, and, and I should point out that, um, you know, I had a great education at Hill. I was, um, if anything, academically probably could have skipped college. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a, college was a time to try to grow up socially. But um, you know, there were rem remarkable faculty that uh, took education really seriously. So I shouldn't 
uh, you know, in any way denigrate a lot of things that I benefited from. That's okay. All right, we have a, a, a live caller, I believe, from Ecuador, one of our students. I'm gonna let, uh, let's see if I can allow him to talk. Um, and are you there? Hello, hello, are you? Is this Juan Bear? Yeah, I'm, I'm Juan Bear. I'm here, right, in, in Ecuador. Hi, Juan Bear. So Juan Bear is one of our students. He's back right. in Ecuador, in Quito. Are you having the virus there as well? Yes, yes. Uh, the thing is not going too well right here, unfortunately. It's spraying pretty quickly. So Juan Bear, you have a question for uh, Mr. Perlstein. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering if you think that like the media has influenced the way that governments are like making their decisions. And if they have, uh, how do you think they've influenced them? Yeah, it's, a, it's the most complicated question and I respect it. And I wish I could give you a, uh, a answer that, uh, that really obtained in every place, but it's, it's so different in every place. For all of our complaining about um, access to government in the United States, in fact, we have a, a life where there are exceptions like the uh, killings in Annapolis a couple of years ago. But in general, um, you know, a journalist uh, really doesn't have to worry about her or his life uh, in the daily pursuit of the job. That's certainly not true in every country. And we do see places where uh, journalists really do, uh, do struggle. Um, Venezuela is certainly one place where um, the best journalists have left the country. Um, and, you know, I can think of other examples like that. I do think that there's a natural tension between journalists who feel that part of their job is to hold government accountable for its actions and government which would do anything it can not to be questioned by these noisy nosy people who don't work for them so that's a kind of tension that you have every place um, and in some places like the philippines uh, it is harder today to be a good journalist than it's ever been. Um, but other places where we are seeing um, much more liberalization taking place. All right, well, Juan Bear, I hope you uh, stay well and we'll look forward to seeing you back at Hill not too long from now, I hope. Yeah, me too, Sorry. thank you very much. Yep, bye-bye. Okay, another hand raised here, we've got uh, Kendall who's uh, just around the corner here, not too far. I'm gonna allow her to talk and unmute her. Kendall, are you there? Kendall? Maybe she raised her hand earlier and forgot about us, so I'm gonna. I'm sorry if that happened. I probably, my answers are probably too long. And I oh. oh no, there she is. Okay, hi Kendall. I was having a, a you know an audio issue, but I do have a question. Um, yes, sure. so when reporting, how do you gauge the amount of opinion that you insert into your writing? And what is your perspective on delivering the truth, right? So do you, how do you decipher your personal truth from the public's right to the truth? No. Um, great question again, and one that we struggle with every day because <clears throat> there are certain traditions that certain kinds of publications have had and others have not. So for example, uh, Time Magazine under, the, uh, under its founder and owner, Henry Luce, um, was always known as a very opinionated publication and he wanted opinion in every piece and the people who bought it, not unlike the people who watch Fox, have certain expectations uh, in terms of what they will get. Um, historically, Newspapers like the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journals tried to separate um, opinion, which would reside on an editorial or op-ed page, from um, what was meant to be objective uh, news every place else. 
we've seen an erosion in those traditions for a couple of reasons. One is with the introduction of the internet, the kind of reporting of who, uh, who, why, what, when, where, um, is really more something that is happening in real time. And so that has made traditional um, publications that focused on objective reporting push for more and more interpretation uh, from their journalists. So that today, if you read the front page of a New York Times or a Los Angeles Times, sometimes it's hard to know whether you're reading a columnist or you're reading a, a deeply reported piece. And I think that's one of the reasons the media struggles now is that um, there's been a loss of credibility that has come with that effort to be much more interpretive to try to tell people not only what happened, but what it means. Um, and I think that's a place where uh, those of us who care about the future of journalism uh, need to be much more transparent in telling a reader or viewer what they're looking at. Uh, this is opinion. This is what I think from my experience. This is what I learned from reporting. And then there's that intermediate ground of, I did so much reporting that I now have a point of view, so let me tell you what it is. And I think that's okay. um, a place where a lot of good work is done, but also where there's a lot of potential for abuse. Mendel, thanks for the question. Hope Thank you're doing you so well. much. You too. Bye. All right, I have a, a question from one of our alumni, um, from Peter. Um, Peter is a sports agent out in Denver, I happen to know that. And he said, being in the sports business and knowing how important papers are to the business of pro sports, is what, uh, what can we do with the current newspaper environment and more so the smaller markets uh, uh, to keep the paper covering sports live? Well, I think it's very hard to bring back a publication like the Denver Post, for example, where uh, the ownership um, uh, really has um, really bought it solely to try to get as much profitability as possible. And so I think that the more likely scenario is that um, you'll have to look for other sources of information for that kind of coverage. So something like The Athletic, which started about a year and a half ago uh, by a former editor of Sports Illustrated, has really gotten a remarkable circulation from people who are willing to pay $10 a month or whatever to, um, to get long form reported stories such as you miss um, from your, your local paper um, in Denver. Uh, you know, there are other things like Bleacher Report and so forth, but I think they don't fill the gap that you're talking about. Um, and in, in many markets, it's gotten very tough to get the kind of coverage that you're looking for. Okay, I have another uh, pr uh, question here um, from one of our students, uh, or maybe a parent of one of our students. Much of news and information today is exaggerated or fake news. What will it take to get our society of news givers to be more respectable and honest with what they are reporting? Well, I don't think that was directed um, specifically at you, Norm. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, that's why I hesitated to answer. Um, so the question is one that I get hit with every day. I wrote a letter to readers over the weekend thanking them for their support and telling them, you know, what things we were having to do. And for instance, I got I'd say maybe a half dozen letters from climate deniers who believe that anybody who says climate change is happening or that mankind has any uh, responsibility for it is providing fake news. Um, so what happens is basically the definition of fake news has become any news that I don't agree with. And uh, in some cases that there are no doubt journalists who either make something up or who are not being straight, but more often than not, the accusation really comes from someone who has a political bias to begin with, 
who feels that the publication that they're looking at is, doesn't share that political bias. So to take an example, um, for several weeks, uh, Fox News was a cheerleader for the belief that the coronavirus was nothing more than the flu, and if we just didn't worry about it, if we weren't trying to overthrow the president of the United States with inflammatory journalism, uh, we would be just fine. And um, those of us who thought that perhaps the risk was greater than uh, what Fox News would tell you uh, could have a vigorous debate about who was responsible for fake news. Um, so I would say, um, I would begin with the question of um, what kind of bias I bring to ask that question. So um, one of the things I did in preparation for this interview, I did a little bit of research on the LA Times. Uh, it's not my normal paper. And uh, I was really excited to see that uh, of all the papers in the country, you're, you're most known for the accuracy of your reporting. You have one of the highest ratings for, for factual reporting. Yeah, but we screw up too. <laughs> we do it on a regular basis. You know, it's... Um, well, so it, that leads to another question here from one of our young alumni, um, Amelia, who says, how has the Hill School motto, whatsoever things are true, things are true. Yes. played a role in your life and profession? Can you, can you dovetail that one? Um, I think it has played a role, um, and I think that uh, the standards that, you know, the Hill uh, stood for and have always stood for, um, you know, actually have served me very well. And I think, um, you know, at the time I was there, I didn't, frankly, spend a whole lot of time trying to reflect on whatsoever things are true. Um, you know, I, I found the reference to it in the New Testament and so forth, but I, but I, um, I really have come to think that it is a pretty good touchstone for uh, how you want to lead your life. All right, Norman, we have uh, three hands raised, and we're going to do this sort of as a speed round. Okay. So I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask so them to... I'm going to have to go into a news meeting in a couple minutes. So okay, perfect. Okay. So let me, uh, I'm going to allow this young man to talk. This is Mamadou. Um, Mamadou, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Mamadou, ask your question quickly. Mr. Perlstein has to go to a news meeting. All right. Um, okay, so like how has like the events that, the historical events basically that you wrote about, how has that helped you like approach basically like the art of writing itself? Yeah. Um, well, actually, I th you know, I've worked in Detroit for a couple of years in the, uh, at the time uh, when General Motors, Ford, Chrysler were among the biggest uh, companies in the country and getting comfortable writing about them, getting comfortable writing about money, realizing that if you make a mistake, you cost people a lot of money, I think enabled me to go on to, you know, Japan and not be afraid to write about the prime minister and so forth. So I'd say that early training, um, covering the auto industry was probably what really prepared me for everything else. Thanks, Mamadou. Thank you. All right, Ryan with a quick question here. Hold on, Ryan, are you there? Ryan, go ahead. Ryan, try one more time here. Uh, sorry, Ryan, I couldn't get you unmuted. I'll try one more time. Ryan, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, so you talked about um, traveling abroad early in your career and reporting there and right. the diversity of LA currently. And I was wondering if living and experiencing a different culture helped right. you to connect with a wide range of people today and how you managed to report outside of the United States. Um, well, in the times I was there, they, I didn't need to speak. Japanese or Chinese, today you would have to. Um, I had an interpreter who worked with me in most of the places where I was. It was more the cultural shift than anything else that 
I think you had to get used to. Um, it was a kind of a cliche that I remember from my first week in Japan where someone explained to me that in both English and Japanese, there's a saying that says we are thinking in parallel ways. And what that means to us in English is we're thinking in the same direction, whereas in Japanese, it meant we're thinking along lines that will never meet. Norm, I'm getting the sense that you're a wanted man right now. Your phone oh, rings. So thank you very much, Zach. I enjoyed this. And uh, as I say, if you find some people who would like a, a complimentary digital subscription, I'd be happy to provide it. Well, thank you so much, uh, Norm. And uh, I'll continue on here. You can get back to okay. uh, what you're doing. Thanks a lot. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are still on the line, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, clearly, a, uh, a terrific. Um, interview there with Norman Perlstein. I hope you'll join us in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, we've got a great speaker on Thursday night, Mike Vaughn, class of 93, uh, and he can talk a little bit about his experience with Venmo and how that's playing out. Uh, April 14th, we'll be joined by uh, Major General Doug O'Dell, class of 67, who um, during his time with the Marine Corps was uh, asked to lead the cleanup of the Gulf Coast after Hurricane Katrina. Um, talk about disaster recovery and um, how that might apply here to COVID-19. We'll be joined by Ashley Schillingsberg, uh, class of 02, who can talk about how eBay and other online retailers are playing a role uh, during this time. Really excited for April 21st when Bernie Chan, class of 84, a deputy to the National People's Congress of China in Hong Kong, is going to be telling us about his experience leading the effort to recovery in Hong Kong. Um, he's been publishing quite a bit, and I think there's a lot to be learned there. And we're still working on some speakers between April and, and mid-May, but uh, we did get confirmation from current parent and past parent, uh, Senator Pat Toomey, here from, the, uh, from a senator here in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm sure he'll have some really interesting things to talk about, the federal response to all of this. Um, we have uh, a number of alumni events coming up. I've mentioned these before but I hope you'll start planning for the 100th anniversary celebration, which may also be part of our reunion schedule this year. The dedication of the Shirley Quadrivium Center, and of course, Lawrenceville weekend on November 6th and 7th. Um, thanks again for joining us and for staying with us as long as you have. Um, and, and a big thanks to, um, to our friend, uh, Norman Perlstein, our friend and alumnus. Um, today, uh, as with all our speakers, we're, uh, we're making a $500 donation in Norm's name to the uh, Hobart's Run Relief Fund um, from the Tom Ruth Endowment. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Hope you'll come back on Thursday night. Have a great night.